Hey guys, um, we're back here doing our Sunday church. Uh, I think this will be the last week that we will do this um, for the foreseeable future. We're planning on being back at Vintage on Eldo um, next Sunday. So keep an eye out on Facebook. We'll try to give you some info that way, but um, we'll have to follow the guidelines. So you'll have to do social distancing when you sit. So you'll have to do probably every other row. Um, and then we'll have to wear masks when we're in the, the sanctuary, I believe. Um, so just be aware that those will probably be the rules when you get there. Um, but just a heads up that this will probably be the last week that we will do church this way. And I will let you know, I am super excited for that. Uh, I have been enjoying getting to interact with you guys on Facebook. And it has definitely inspired us that we will record services from now on and post them. Um, but there's just something about being together and being in a church service that beats this experience um, of being by myself in my basement doing this. So uh, just a heads up that way. Um, but other than that, we're going to continue today through the book of Luke. We decided to go through the book of Luke as a church because we wanted to make disciples. It felt like um, knowledge was lacking in the world we live in when it comes to people claiming to be followers of Christ. And so we just decided as a church we would just start at square one. Um, and so we picked the gospel of Luke to go through line by line. And we've been doing that now for almost a year. Um, and we will keep doing it until there's no more Gospel of Luke to go through. Today we're going to be in chapter 13. We're going to pick up in verse 6. Um, and so if you guys want to flip there on your phones or in your old school Bibles or um, on your web browser, however you're doing that, feel free to do that as we get ready to jump into it. Today we get to talk about one of my favorite things. I come from a long line of people who love to tell stories. Um, and Lowry stories, Edrington stories, they tend to be... Um, a little, they're big fish stories is what we call them. So you can always tell when uh, some one of us is in go mode and they're telling that you're always like, I wonder how much of this actually happened, how much of this they are embellishing to make the story better. I think that's just part of um, being in front of people and that kind of thing. You kind of just learn to do that to be, to be funny. So, um, you know, it is what it is, but I love a good story. I love to tell good stories. I love a good joke. Um, all of those things really relate to my heart. I love to read. I love to watch movies. And so anytime somebody tells a good story, especially one with a point, you usually will catch me um, hook, line, and sinker for that. And so today's message and today's scripture that we're going to look at is near and dear to my heart because we're going to cover one of Jesus' parables. Um, and so just before we jump into that as a, a form of introduction, let's run through again what parables are. Um, a parable is a way of conveying a point, so conveying an idea like, Jesus will take care of the church, or you need to repent and come back to the right ways, and Jesus is going to help you do that. So that would be the point. But then they use like mundane things that people can relate to to convey that um, to them. And then Jesus is notorious for not explaining to the crowd what he's talking about, which I find immensely entertaining when you stop and put these things into context and think about the one guy in the crowd that didn't get it, that went home and was like, I don't know what he's talking about. He's talking about growing plants and stuff and then we got to take care of the plants because somebody's going to show up and check on the plants so I don't know I think we're supposed to check our plants uh yeah so I, that is always my take on on it and how it works that's what I feel like you would have that guy in the crowd and his disciples if you read through uh the gospels you will see oftentimes they're like hey Jesus explain this parable or that parable um and so we're going to look at a parable today and then we're going to dig into it and kind of explain what Jesus is trying to get at um but first I want you guys just to Play a little game with me here before I read this to you. What I want you to do is just pretend that you are, um, you're a Jew, Jewish person, Jewish man, Jewish woman. You're in a crowd. Uh, you, you've, you've traveled or whatever to hear this Jesus speak. You've heard things about him, that he heals the sick. He, he helps the blind to see, the lame to walk. He raises people from the dead. You've heard all kinds of stories. He's not afraid of going at it with, with the uh, established religious community. And then he gets up, and this is the message he preaches. So just think about that then as we look at these verses uh, in Luke chapter 13, picking up in verse 6. It says this, And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. He said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. Think about that. All right? Think about how you would respond. You show up. He's gonna. He's notorious for being this great preacher and these great points, these great messages. He stands up and he goes, okay, today's message is there's a guy who owns a fig tree that's not making figs. 
And so he says to the guy that's in charge of keeping his fig trees, he says, cut this one down, it's not growing figs. And that guy that's in charge of keeping the tree said, hey, before we cut it down, let me dig out around it, re repack the soil, and let me put some good manure on it, and we'll see if it will, if it will produce. And then if it doesn't produce by next year, then we can cut it out. Thanks. Uh, if you guys want to come down for prayer, you can. This has, been, uh, this has been a good time with you and a good message. Thank you. Have a good night. Right? You would be like, what is going on? What did it, I do not understand a word of this or a word of what is going on. So before we go much further, let's put it into the context at least so there's some bearing that you might have been able to pick up because one of the underlying things that's here is the Old Testament idea that Israel or the Jewish people are oftentimes referred to as a fig tree. Um, one of the most famous places you find that is in Hosea chapter 9, verse 10. It says this, Like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel. Like the first fruit on the fig tree in its first season, I saw your fathers. Right? So there's this idea then that Israel is the fig tree. So it's probably safe to say in Jesus' parable, that's what it represents. Is that Israel, the Jewish people, are this fig tree. And then the man comes along and he noticed it's not producing any fruit. Well, the man then in the story and in this parable and what we can gather from what Jesus is trying to say is that's God the Father. So God shows up on the scene and looks at his chosen people and says, they're not producing the fruit that I want them to produce. And that fruit is accepting Christ as the Messiah and understanding that there's going to come a new way of doing it, a new covenant through the shedding of his blood. And it's going to incorporate all people and we're going to love each other and care for each other and take care of each other and put others before ourselves and that's going to be the moniker that will define Christianity and define followers of Yahweh and followers of Christ. And, and the Jews are not latching onto that. And so the, the tree is withering and dying. And so God fully intends then to cast judgment on this tree and say, this tree is not doing what I've created it to do. To do. The Jews are not being what I want them to be. So I'm going to remove it. I'm going to cut this out. I'm going to get rid of this thing that doesn't do what I wanted to do, which is a reminder to all of us that the wages of sin is death. If you choose to reject God, if you choose to reject what he has for you, if you choose not to dwell in the grace of Jesus Christ and the cross, then you will reap death. You will reap isolation. That's what the Bible says. That's what we believe. And I know it doesn't play well in the world that we live in, but I don't want to sugarcoat it here at Vintage. I don't want you guys to be confused or walk out and not understand the gospel. This is what it says. And so that is a nature of God. That is a part of who he is. He's just. And so if something isn't doing what it's supposed to be, if something is not becoming how it's supposed to become, then God will cut it out. But then there's the new character in this parable. There's the other person, and that's the vine dresser. And so a vine dresser then was somebody who took care of your garden. So if you had a lot of money and you had a giant orchard or a giant garden, a giant um, place to grow grapes or whatever, you, you know, you had one of those things going on, you would pay this person to keep track of your plants and to take care of it and weed it and, and trim vines and make sure everything grew appropriately. And, and we know that Christ is the vine dresser in this parable. And so what, what he says is Christ says to God the Father, he says, hey, before you cut it out, can you show some grace here and let me tend to it? Let me dig out around it. Let me break it free of what it, what it thinks it's supposed to do, like a stick in the mud. Let me move this thing. And, and move the roots around and break it open. And then let me cover it with fertilizer. Let me put things on it that will cause it to create new life. Let me do that. Let's do all the things that we need to do to ensure it can have a, a victory and a win. And then in a year, if it doesn't produce figs, if it still is a dead plant, then we can cut it out. And so that's the, the parable that you have is that Jesus is saying, look, God wants to cast judgment on this, but he's going to tarry and he's going to wait to give you an opportunity to accept me as the Messiah. But if you will not accept me as the Messiah, then I will cut you out. I will remove you from this thing. I will take you from, from what it is you're going to be. And we know from the New Testament, that's essentially what happens. When you get into Paul's writing, Paul says that because the Jews reject Christ, that God chooses to graft in all the Gentiles and he opens up salvation for all men and not just the Jewish people. And thus we're all God's chosen people if we choose to follow Christ. And there's this idea then that's built into the New Testament that because the Jews rejected the Messiah, God went to the Gentiles who would accept him. And that's how Christianity spreads and goes forth. But before we move out of here today and before we end this, let's look at some things that we can take from this. Because you may be sitting there and thinking to yourself, I'm not Jewish, right? 
Like that's not a wrong place to go in your head. You may be like, this is good and all, and it's a nice message and I can gain something from that, but I'm not Jewish. Um, and so what, what am I supposed to get from it? Well, and in the same way there's expectation for the Jewish people to produce certain fruit, there's also expectation for Christians to produce fruit. And that fruit is how you influence people. That fruit is ultimately winning people to understanding of Christ and loving people and being patient with people as they ask questions and as they dig into trying to understand what faith is and that produces fruit. But there's also the fruit that's just produced when you're nice to people, right? When you love people, when you show compassion to people, when you show empathy to people, when you go above and beyond to reach out and help somebody. And so what Jesus is teaching, what Jesus is saying is like, look, when God looks at your life and there's no fruit to say that you're planted in fertile soil of Christ, when there's nothing in your life that says that Christ has tended to who you are and he's affected how you grow and he's affected the type of plant you're going to be and you're not producing anything of value, then you are to be cast aside. But you chose that. You made that decision, and that's a big hurdle for people to get over, and I think people get mad sometimes and get frustrated and hurt when you talk about faith and talk about Christianity and say, well, it's not fair that God condemns or God... We condemn ourselves. There's expectations on how to live and how to act, and if you don't live and act that way, then there are consequences for them, and, and that's what the Bible teaches. That's what society teaches. We believe that way, but for some reason with Christianity, that's a hang-up, and so it's important when we look at this parable that the first thing you understand is that God has expectations for you. There's an expectation that you become a new thing, right? There's an expectation that when you say, I'm going to become a follower of Christ, that that changes how you interact with the world. And until you make that decision, I, nobody needs to be in your business telling you how to live and how to act. It's so funny with Christians that we want to force people into a worldview that they don't accept, and then we want to get mad when they do things that go counter to our own worldview. They don't believe the way we do. And if they choose not to believe the way we do, then we need to love them and pray for them and ask God to give us an inroad and an understanding on how to plant fertile things around a tree so they will produce fruit. It's like a big game. You gotta figure out, how do I communicate with this person? How do I dig through all of their past and all of their hangups and all their preconceived ideas and preconceived notions so that I convey the cross to them so that they'll understand who Jesus is? Because sometimes the only vine dresser those people will ever experience is the Christ who lives in you. So the fruit you produce is literally you just taking care of a dead tree. It's finding that one person in your life that is a bump on a log and just trying to love them and communicate with them as they dig through whatever that thing is that they struggle with. And so the first thing that we know then is God has expectations for all of his trees. He has expectations for all of us. The next thing though is this. God's judgment is stalled by Jesus' grace. It's such an important thing that you learn here and it's such an important understanding of who Christ is. Jesus' grace, grace trumps God's judgment. It's not that God isn't going to judge. It's not that God is not going to be just. It's not that God doesn't do it. It's that God tarries. He holds. He waits because he trusts Jesus that what Jesus says could come to fruition. And if there's an avenue for people to become a tree that produces fruit and to get out of death and to become a new thing if they'll just believe in Jesus, then of course God is going to tarry and wait. And so for some of us, you may feel like you've done too much or you've gone too far or you've said too many things or that no God would ever accept you or love you. And what I would tell you is this, that's just not true. There is nothing on this planet, on this earth, that can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. Some of you may not love Jesus. Some of you may not love religion. You may not love Christians. You may not, whatever it is, but what I'm telling you is in spite of all of that anger and resentment and hate you have in your heart, Jesus still loves you. He still loves you. Whether you like it or not, he still has this deep love for you. And he doesn't look at you like you are a broken mess who has rejected him. He looks at you like a tree that needs tended to. It's an interesting idea to stop and really think about this parable and run down the road and recognize that the, the thing the vine dresser spends more time on are the trees that don't produce fruit. The, the thing that gets more of Christ's attention, the thing that Christ is more concerned with is that tree that's not being what it's supposed to be as opposed to the healthy plants. Why? Because the healthy plants are healthy. They're doing what they're supposed to do. They're growing like they're supposed to grow. They're, they're healthy like they're supposed to be. He's not, he doesn't have to be worried with them. What he's worried with is this plant that's not 
working the way it's supposed to be. And that is a sub-theme all through Jesus' parables. This idea of the lost sheep and the lost coin. Like Jesus has this underlying thing where it's so important to him to go after the one. To go after that one person or that one thing that's separated from what God has. Because if you can just say the right thing. If you can just communicate the right way. If you can just be in the right moment with that person. You may wake that tree up from the dead. And so Jesus focuses on that. And he, he thinks about that. Which brings us to the next point. Jesus sees potential in people where others want to throw in the towel. This is one of those things that I try to let define my life. I don't see anybody as garbage. In this world we live in, and the times that we're in, and the things that are going on reek of this. People have preconceived ideas and preconceived notions about who people are because of the color of their skin, or because of their socioeconomic status, or because of who their parents are, or what job they have, or what school they went to. And all of these things determine whether or not somebody has any worth. And that is completely counter to the cross and to Christianity. Every person from the most homeless, opiate addicted, crackhead addict on the streets, no home, no family, to the most opulent person you know, all have value in God's eyes and all need to be redeemed by the cross. And until they're redeemed, you don't know what they're capable of. My mom's got quite the green thumb. She loves to shop for flowers. It's one of those things she's always done. And it's one of those things you just associate with mom and Mother's Day and getting her flowers and doing that. Well, one of my things my mom cracks me up that she loves to do is she loves to go to Walmart and buy the flowers nobody wants. The flowers that are there on that table that are like 50 cents and everybody kind of walks by them because they're all broken and weird. And then she loves to buy them and she loves to plant them and then nurse them back to health. And it's a testament, I think, to just how we should think about people. Like, I don't, when you meet somebody or when you're introduced to somebody or when somebody comes into your life, I don't really care about what their situation was leading to that moment. All I really care about is what they're going to look like walking away from the moment. I want you to know who Jesus is. And I want your knowledge of Christ to affect how you live and how you act. If the world would just adopt the golden rule... Just do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And then love God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and love people. It would be a perfect culture. That's all we have to do. It's just love people for who they are as individuals. And yet we live in this broken, messed up world where people struggle with this. And so I hope when you study this parable, when you look at it, you can grab hold of that idea that Jesus wants to take those things that the world has rejected, that, the, that people look at and go, this is dead, it has no value, let's cut it out, and say, hey, hold up, before we cast that judgment, let's wait, let's invest, let's care for, let's love, let's do what we have to do to facilitate so this thing can flourish and become what it was intended to be. And I have seen people walk out of the maw of hell as a hot mess. People that you would look at and go, there's no way they'll ever get it together. And I have seen God grab hold of that person and completely reshape the way they see the world and who they are. Christ is bigger than anything in this world. He always has been and he always will be. And so because of that, we at Vintage and I personally will never see one person better than any other person. All I see is you are a live and healthy tree or you're a dead tree. And if you're a dead tree, we need to spend time with you and be around you so that you can become a live tree and change your mindset. Which brings me to my last point then today. The last thing that we can learn from this is this. You have to be willing to allow God to mess with your roots. You have to be willing to allow Christ to mess with your roots. The biggest part of Christianity is learning to submit your own pride and your own will and your own understanding and allow Jesus to shape who you are. To really dig into scripture and really dig into the study of who, who he was and what he said and allow that philosophy then to begin to change the way you function and you see the world. It always cracks me up when people are like, I don't like Christianity or I don't like religion and then you start to dig into it and you're like, I don't really understand what you don't like. How can you not like the idea of a society where every man looks out for every other man? And how can you not like a society where we say all life is sacred? And where we decide that nobody will ever go hungry? And that no widow will ever be alone? And that no orphan will never have a home? Like this is a good thing. It's a utopian ideal that is put, presented when we talk about the kingdom of God. And it's what Jesus is calling all of us to and to live like. 
So you don't want to reject that. What people are really getting at when they say that is they've been hurt and they've been, they've been messed up by other people. It's a pride thing. You don't want to give up all your preconceived notions. You're rooted in these ideas. It's exactly what the Jews were doing when Jesus showed up. They wanted their Messiah to look and behave a certain way. Jesus shows up, he doesn't look that way, and so they reject him. Don't reject Jesus in your life because of something Christians did or something that somebody said or did or some book you read or some podcast you listened to without vetting who that person was. Dig into it yourself. Understand it yourself. Christ is calling all of you from a dead place to a live place. And that's the beauty of this parable as we come to the end of this today. God doesn't see you as a dead tree. He sees you as a tree with potential. And his grace trumps his judgment. And he's willing to wait if you're willing to submit your roots to allow Christ to change you. He wants you to be a new thing. He wants you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Are you willing to submit to that? And church, are you willing to do the work? The Bible teaches that we are the hands and feet of Christ in the world. Christ left, gave us the Holy Spirit so that we could go be like him in the world. We essentially become vine dressers when we become healthy. And so we then are responsible to tend the dirt around those who are dead to fertilize them and to teach them, to love them and accept them, to listen to their questions and their frustrations and their hurt and their pain and always be open to the conversation and never burn bridges and do everything from a place of compassion and empathy. That's what Christ is calling us to. And that's the church we're asking you to be. And so like we say every week, go be that church.